roll call? Secretary? Okay. Michael Aldinger? Mike Anderson? Jim Byrne? Ruth Kanagaraja? Mark Cannon? Yep. Ralph Cabello? Here. Pat Gordon? Nicholas Heim? Here. Hubert Hines? Here. Andrew Karasek?
the, where everyone, every single committee is compiling a budget for a show calls budget, uh, as we had talked about. Uh, that's going to go to the Student Activity Fee Board on uh, January 30th. Uh, I've been pretty pleased uh, with the model that Stephen Lucas had originally created for the budget process this year. Um, every committee is going to basically go off that because he had a really strong uh, presentation that he made originally. Uh, so I, I know from my standpoint, Mike and I are working on the executive cabinet budget and all the committees are getting that together. So we should, uh, the next couple weeks, we should have a set allocation to know what's going to be going on for the future. So that's definitely a strong sign as far as the stability of this organization. Uh, that's it for now. We have to entertain any questions. Any questions? Um, just uh, to add to that, um, Rodney and I, uh, that was Greg Meifer today, um, just to kind of uh, go over the ticket, um, the football ticket policy again, um, and then he's going to be meeting with Bobby, me, Gavin, George, um, Alfonso, um, again in the near future to discuss any new changes that we might want to make with the uh, the allocation of the tickets. So, any questions about that? I mean, it's we didn't really discuss any potential decisions that would be made that would be at a that would be at a future meeting. So, any questions for Gavin or me? Okay. Moving on to old business, none. New business, Elections Act of 2009. This uh, did not pass through steering again, so it has to be brought to the floor by two-thirds. We can have an introduction from ID, though. Um, so, Mr. Karasik? Uh, how's everybody doing this evening? Um, before you is the uh, 2009 Elections Code. Uh, what it is, is it's the 2008 Elections Code with additions, as you'll see here, and as I'll just most certainly point out, with necessary edits, both grammatical, spelling, things like that. Um, and there's, as I said, there were a couple of provisions that were added that we feel are necessary to help along with these elections. Um, if anybody thinks that there needs to be some other additions, then I please would encourage you to add those to an amendment. Um, otherwise, ID spent a long time looking over this and redoing it, so that's basically what it is. This is a code that will govern how our elections work. Um, obviously, since next week's a work session, we won't be meeting. We, um, the election commissioners will not be coming before you until the following general assembly meeting, which is the following week. Uh, but they'll come before you, and this will be the, the uh, code that uh, governs that. Will you stand for questions? Oh, sure. OK. Are there any questions? Can you guys tell him that he can bring that equipment in? <coughs> come on in. Thank you for bringing that. OK, are there any questions? Representative Lucas. It's in the very back last page. There's a timeline um, that speaks to the entire thing. It's April 1st, April Fool's Day. Um, it's mandated by our Constitution that it be the Wednesday of the 12th week of the semester. So, yes, it is April Fool's Day this year. Um, so, we should have a little bit of fun with that. Other questions? Any objections to bringing this to the floor? Okay. With that, discussion on the election vote. Representative, or Mr. Cavalli. I, I do want to commend the ID committee. I was there for three hours plus hours, I think. Um, of their, uh, I guess it would be a third, second or third meeting, they spent a uh, vast majority of their time going over it. Um, and they worked, from my understanding, another hour or so after about two hours going through it. Uh, they did a good job of cleaning it up and, and trying to fix some of the loopholes that were brought up from the previous election commission, um, some suggestions for the president, um, and myself, and other members of the association. Um, so uh, I think that their revision of this is. Very well, uh, very well done. Um, it tightens up a lot of different things and explains a lot of different things. Hopefully, um, given that we're a month earlier than last year, moving forward with our elections, um, getting this passed, um, making sure everything's uh, 
good with this and moving forward will enable us to have more successful elections. I will, however, uh, bring your attention, and I have two amendments uh, to the document. Um, one small one that's more contentious, uh, looking through this, um, as I hope all of you did, let me find where they um, The first one is just uh, uh, for sense. Um, it's 7.4.4. Unfortunately, these aren't numbered. I didn't realize that before I photocopied the thing. But 7.04.04. Um, it says, uh, and this was a clarification that I gave to the committee, uh, but it, it doesn't read quite right. Um, it says, if the plea is guilty, the commission and or hearing board shall judge the severity. Basically, this provision, what it's meant to say, or what it should say, is if um, a candidate pleads guilty to a charge from the commission, then the commission itself deals the punishment they as prescribed above. So it should read, um, if the plea is guilty, the commission um, shall judge um, the severity. Um, but if the, in the amendment is to add, but if um, the plea is not guilty, the hearing board will judge the severity. And the other amendment that I'm going to be proposing, um, and we can handle these separately, I'll just throw them out there right now, um, is on 8.13. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, I would actually like to hear the rationale for reverting this back, um, but it's basically the cumulative vote total that's required in order to get, um, be considered elected. And at one point, the old constitution was mandated that everyone had to have 250 votes. Um, the new constitution will remove those requirements, but in the election code we put in a percentage, um, and we said we're on 7%, uh, but for some reason uh, the IT committee reinserted uh, the 250 votes or 7%, which would still mean that you know the president would only have the 250 votes instead of 7% of the entire undergraduate student body um, with, with that board there. So uh, those are the two areas uh, I'm looking to amend. I'll make it just the first motion now deal with them separately. Um, so I move to amend 7.04.04 um, for the statement to read, if the plea is guilty, if the plea is guilty, uh, the commission shall judge the severity, or if the plea is not guilty, the hearing board shall judge the severity, based upon the advantage gained by the campaign, by the violation of the rules, the candidate's intent, the amount of harm, if any cause to community members, the university or other party. So the rest of that remains the same as read right now. Is there a second on that? Second. 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 Any objections? No, just to the first one, which is on 7.4.4. Um, so, taking out or hearing board. So, any objections to that amendment? Okay. There we stands. Further discussion? Mr. Cairns. Uh, Ralph, I was there when they did this, and uh, part of the reason was that 7% of an at large representative. Um, even if you have, say, you have 33,000, would be 2,310. Uh, many of our IMRF representatives did not get that last time, therefore they technically should have been seated in their office. Uh, that was the basis for putting it back to 250 for the at-large representatives. Uh, I, I myself did not technically get 2,310. So. I'll, I'll make the amendment and then I'll explain because I think there might be some um, clarification needed. So I move to amend 8.13. Um, and strike uh, 250 votes, and when 250 votes cannot be satisfied. So it should read, for each office, the cumulative vote total must be 7% of the eligible voting population for a candidate for that office to be considered elected. The professional shall be determined by the commission resolving um, the appropriate university authorities. So we may introduce that. Yeah, I'll just introduce it and then we'll debate it um, if there's a second. Um, it's not per individual, it's a cumulative for the office. So, for example, at large is considered one office by the Constitution, by the Commission. So, all at large representatives would have to have a cumulative vote total of 7%. Um, the idea behind having any percentage is to make sure that you have a competitive election. 
Um, that way people are, are basically advertised to get, try and generate people to come vote for themselves. It was thought unfair, one of the unfair things of the old constitution was that it imposed an individual limit of 250 votes. It's very hard for an individual to, I mean, to, to try and get any votes versus another individual. Um, so it was thought that if we took it per seat, so for example, all the presidential candidates would be required to get 7% of the other population. All the at-large candidates would have to get 7%. All of um, the on-campus representatives have to get 7% of that voting population in order. So it's basically polling the vote to ensure that people are actively campaigning and not just putting themselves in the ballot. Um, the reason why I don't think there should be 250 votes is because we ran into this problem before. Uh, one, I and mean, large representatives have 33,000 people to pull from. So 250 votes is minuscule. Um, but for example, IDS has not even barely 250 people in a college to pull from. So on a, you don't put a percentage scale, you put an absolute scale. It's unfair, fair, excuse me, depending on what seat you're running for. So it's a cumulative vote, not an individual vote. Um, maybe you don't even want any vote caps, but I think it helps spur election. So that's the amendment, the rationale for making a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any, everyone clear on that? So doing away with all 250, keeping the 7% in 8.13, okay. Any objections to that? Representative Miller, would you like to? Well, I would actually just like to hear Representative Karasik's rationale on the committee's rationale for putting that idea. Okay. The uh, reason was it was a misinterpretation on our part. Um, we thought that that meant that each representative had to get 7%, as Sean and myself would point out that we did not nearly get 7% of the total 33,000 undergraduates to vote for us individually. Obviously, for the eight at-large that ran, we, we satisfied more than 7%. So the, the operative word there is cumulative. Um, it was just a misread on our part. So that technically, that never should have been put in. So this amendment is back. OK, so discussion on this amendment. Representative Nock. I would just like to clarify. So every person playing, um, for example, at-large seats, the cumulative votes for everyone who cast a vote for an MRC has to exceed 7% of the school budget. 7% or higher. Yeah, it, it, it's just in your constituency. So if you're at large, yeah, the entire student body of the population, if you're on campus and on campus, if you're in Everly College of Science and the students in the college. Representative Hines? Is there a provision if, like, a lot of people don't want to run? Let's say, like, we only had six people run for one campus the last time. Say this time only four people run. Most four people now have to get seven versus six getting seven, or how does that work out? Yeah. I, I can answer that. Go ahead. Yeah, the four would be responsible for generating that seven percent of, uh, of, the, of the vote. Um, like I said, it, it's not a perfect system. Uh, based, I mean, this provision wasn't really a compromise for the old system, which imposed limits. Um, but the idea is to force candidates running not to be passive but to be aggressive. Um, because now, if there's only six people running for six seats, well, if there are no provisions in your damage to the seat, there's no reason to do any work at all. This provision makes it so that you, as, a, as Lisa, as six people or four people, have to get a certain amount. And that kind of justifies you running. Otherwise, if there are six people only running for six seats, it's really not an election. Um, you really don't have to do anything. But if there's still that, Competition, you, know, you still have to get seven percent of the votes, which I think is a pretty reasonable number to even have an election. Um, that makes you do something, even though it's not considered a competitive, a competitive election in the sense that you have an opponent or more people running versus seats. Isn't that a disproportionately handicapped uh, candidates, who, aspiring candidates who want to run for the academic positions, and also one that also defeat the purpose of signing positions to get on the ballot? I was actually two years ago. I actually wasn't in favor of this provision, provision, so I kind of find it funny that I'm defending it now. Um, but the reason why it was put in, um, and and the reason why it's there, and, and you know, I, I think the last election proved that we only had, I think, it was at large representatives, which were competitive. Um, so I know as an engineering student representative, I had to get seven percent of the vote, and I was I was there's no one opposing me, so I still had a campaign like I was running against an opponent. 
um, I call it in 7%. Because I had to get 7% of the engineering students to turn out and actively pass a vote for me saying they want Ralph as their representative. Um, I think that if you don't have some provision in retrospect now, um, then I think it, it, you know, I could have one, I could vote for myself and no one else in the entire college could vote if I'm unopposed and barring the writings or whatever, you know, I would be elected. Um, so in retrospect, you know, I originally opposed, opposed it mostly because of the old constitution, but in retrospect, I think you need to have some provision. And there are some problems with it. I think you alluded to some of them. If you have three people, it's a little harder to get 7% than if you have six. Um, but the provision really is until we get 20 people running for four seats or 20 people running to six seats. Then you really don't need that provision. You're always going to have 7% if you have competitive elections. But until we get to that point where we have lots of people running for seats, we actually have competitive elections, yeah, it's important to have this provision, I think, now in retrospect. Representative Ogilberg? I'm actually not exactly sure how running works because I didn't exactly run. I was appointed. But I have a feeling my college is very small. I think we are about 1,000 people. And it's so hard to even get people to show up to student council meetings that it would basically be impossible to get 7% of those people to even consider voting even or reach out to that. And I really feel that it does hurt the smaller academic colleges. And maybe there should be an exception for the academic reps. Thank you. Mr. Cairns? Yeah, I know last year wasn't a problem. Um, but I do understand what you're saying, uh, that it potentially could be a problem. But I mean, 7%, even if you have 1,000 people, it's only 70 people. And I do understand what you're saying as far as the academic colleges. We can't really get out as many people. but. Historically, since it's been enacted, it really hasn't been an issue to date. Um, so I mean, that's just something to look at. But I do understand. Mayor? Yeah, sure. What is the procedure if you don't get 7% of the people that you want to? It would follow the appointment procedures in our bylaws. So okay. for academic reps, it would revert back to the councils for appointment because it's a vacant seat.
for your in your constituency voted, and that is the number we're going to say is a valid election. Um, whether that's going to reduce the number of people, could it be possible that someone misses it by one vote and has to be appointed by their council? Is that a better alternative than just seating them? I don't know. I mean, that's something I think we can debate right now. But uh, the problem definitely exists. But once again, I was originally opposed to this, but now you know it made me work harder getting elected, and I, I, I do think that. It was originally instituted specifically for academic seats to make sure that those running, even if unopposed, would have to run. Um, and that people being elected by two votes wouldn't just be considered elected by a constituency. So it, it, it tries to raise the bar in terms of what, what we consider an elected position. I would just like to strongly encourage um, everybody in the assembly to vote no on this. Further discussion on the amendment, Representative Pearson. Uh, Chair Cavallo, I believe um, Representative Smith's question to you was whether you would consider a friendly amendment to separate out the academic representatives from or not. So, um, yeah, I kind of answered that around that way. Matt, sorry. Um, no, I wouldn't support an, uh, an amendment. Um, to exclude the academic seats, even though I do know that it's, it's difficult in some of the smaller units. Um, I think that 7% is a reasonable number out of any constituency if you truly want to be considered elected. Maybe we can lower that percent. I mean, we're debating that now. Maybe 7% is a little too high. Maybe we want to go 5% be a little more cautious. But I do think that there should be a set percent that's applied that's a universal standard to all constituencies that we judge as a body to be considered elected by students able to represent them. Um, I think we can debate a percentage if you have suggestions on revising the percentage. Representative Lucas? Um, I think part of the election process is going to show us whether or not UPUA is gained respect on campus and whether students are engaged. Um, I would I personally am going to vote no on this amendment on the, fact, on the basis that I think we need to look at this election as um, symptomatic of our success or failure this year. Um, I think we'll see if more people run these academic councils, if there's more interest and desire to be part of the QA. If there are more students voting, there are obviously more students invested in the election. Um, with that said, I um, sympathize with the concerns of the academic council. Representative Lerner? Um. Um, I agree with this amendment, um, and I think you answered, or at least my opinion, how to address the academic council seats, although I'm not an academic representative. I think that even in the small colleges that was brought up, uh, that will have trouble getting this, these number of votes, um, but uh, I don't think that's a problem with the, the amendment or the code at all. I think that's maybe a problem of running uncontested. Because uh, even as uh, it was mentioned earlier, there's small, smaller colleges that like, if you have if, if you have a thousand students and two people running for that seat, each person has to get 35 votes. Uh, if it's seven percent, um, so that's a, that's an exceptional number. Um, and so uh, I, I've got to say that I think the problem is with us not with people not running now.
Representative Knock. I just want to reiterate to you simply that the cause of not allowing people to simply walk into these positions is served by the petition that we have to all pass along to get on the ballot in the first place. So because we have a petition, I personally see no need for minimum percentage of votes in order for the election to be deemed legitimate. Mr. Bell. I just want to clarify the amendment. Voting no on the amendment will actually keep 250 votes and 7% right. in the document. I'm only asking to remove 250 votes um, because that our, that number is not fair across academic count colleges. For example, a thousand with a percentage, okay, um, it would be 70 votes. With this, it's 25%. Um, so this is unfair to small academic units um, while completely irrelevant to larger units. So my amendment really doesn't deal with a percentage or not. It deals with a solid number. So by voting no against this, I mean, it, it doesn't accomplish the goal of getting rid of the percentage. That's going to require another amendment. Um, so this is actually a clarification reverting back to the 2008 code. Now, to clarify some things that have been said, um, this percentage was cleared by the faculty Senate for two years. They've accepted our results um, with, with some sort of percentage standard, once with a number um, a flat 250 once with a, with a percentage in there. I don't think that's going to sway them either way from seating student senators um, or discouraging academic units to allowing you to run this in the elections um, with that regard. Um, I do think that if we're worried about vote, increasing voter turnout, and last year we increased voter turnout beyond, uh, you know, we've steadily been increasing, removing this provision is going to be a disincentive for people to encourage um, voter turnout in small colleges, etc. Um, really, the question we're not even dealing with now. But the question of like having a percentage or not having a percentage is really a question of what do we consider being elected? Is being elected by one person really being elected? That's what the whole percentage issue is. I don't think being elected by one person is elected. Maybe seven percent isn't right. Maybe five percent is more reasonable. Whatever. Um, but there is a certain number of people who should have to vote for you in order for you to be considered elected. Yes, there are other provisions about you have to get signatures, et cetera, 100 signatures or whatever, um, in order to be on the ballot. But getting people to ver vote and turn out, you know, getting someone to sign a petition is not an endorsement of you. It is merely a judgment of your qualifications to be placed on the ballot. Voting is the only way that's a judgment of your position statement. Um, so I, I hope I clarified a few things in that. Right now, we're just voting on to remove that 250 to get it back to what the 2008 code is, not to eliminate percentage. But I kind of defended it the percentage since we've been talking about it as well. Representative Lucas. Motion to Okay, is there a second on ending the debate on this amendment? Yes, Any objections to ending the debate on this amendment? Okay, moving to a vote. Uh, show of hands. Everyone clear on this amendment from the last time? No. Okay. If we say yes, what are we saying yes to? If you say, <laughs> okay, if you raise your hand, yes. You are raising your hand to strike 250 votes and to strike um, act also where it is underlined when uh, 250 votes cannot be satisfied. Correct, Mr. Gavilla? Correct. Everyone good on that? Good question? Good question. I'd like to clarify, as it stands right now, it's 250 votes for 7%. Yeah. Right. When, when 250 cannot be satisfied. Yeah. So maybe it's when Correct. Yeah, I have a question. Either way. Sorry. <laughs> well, we still have to vote on it. So, is everyone clear on what we're voting on? Two, we're striking the 250. The underlying stuff. Yeah, the underlying stuff. Is there a question? Last question. No, I was just going to say maybe it will help if you read it without. Okay, I will read it. If you raise your hand in the affirmative, this is what you would like this to say. For each office, everyone on the right page and everything? Okay, for each office, the cumulative vote total must be 7% of the eligible voting population for a candidate for that office to be considered elected. This, yeah, that's seven. Okay, so all in favor, please raise your hand. Hi, please, because I can't count very well.
19, all opposed? Raise your hand high, please. Four extensions. Hi, please. One, two, and three. <laughs> um, the vote total is 19 for three. Uh, the amendment passes. Can't do math. Okay, the vote total is 19 for three. It passes. Further discussion on. The election code. Prince Edward Kerasek. Just in case anyone is confused, I'm going to explain what we just did and what still needs to be done if the academic representatives want to pursue what they were discussing before. What just happened was the 250 provision was removed, that is all. We got very off traffic when we started discussing the other thing because no matter what happened, we were going to want to remove the 250 vote and Ralph's motion was not going to change, to change anything else. So we did get off topic there although discussion was rather interesting. If someone in this room, I'm not going to make this motion, but if someone in this room would like to change, as it currently stands, 7% would be required for every seat, academic, uh, and everyone else. If someone in this room would like to change that, then they, then they need to make a motion now. Otherwise, you know, when this document is passed, it will pass with 7% uh, as the required vote total for everyone. Okay, further discussion on the elections code. Representative Loner. Was there actually an issue with people from academic colleges not getting enough petitions to get on the ballot, or were people still just running knowing one person got enough petitions? I'm kind of wondering how that I don't recall any such. I know that's one of the reasons why I was changed from your academic, from whatever voting constituent you're from, of any student. Um, it was just students saying that you're competent enough to run. It wasn't necessarily a constituency saying. Representative Smith? Yeah, I mean, 
Actually, the problem I'm trying to address is getting more names. 
things on the ballot so that one person can't say, I've got this in the bag and, uh, for every election. President Smith? I moved to amend the amendment to read a petition of signatures from registered undergraduate students at University Park with a minimum of 250 signatures for president slash vice president ticket or a minimum of 100 signatures for all other offices, comma, with an exception for the academic representative offices which do not be required to obtain a petition of students.
fill that 7% of votes if they can't go out there and get 100 signatures. And I'm sure that it, it's difficult. I went to several Everly College signs, um, student council meetings, and it's very small. And, you know, there are maybe 10 people there, but and then that falls whoever's running, they need to just put themselves out there and go to work meetings and meet more people in their classes and stuff to a really serious stop running. Senator Lombard? I'm on the Academic Affairs Committee, but I'm not a senator, but I do sympathize with them, but I'm also not in agreement with this, um, this amendment because to me it seems that, uh, like other uh, representatives have expressed, that this is a, a uh, reduction in the way that we're seeing ourselves. I think that a lot of uh, a lot of cloud needs to be put on how much are they willing to fill out and seek these votes. I think that's going to bring a lot of publicity for us as an organization for, you know, just coming to our own right now. We don't really have a lot of publicity still, and I think a lot of people don't know who we are. And last year, I had a lot of fruitful discussions with people as I was getting signatures, but they didn't even know there was an election. And I'm worried if we take this out, that those discussions that happened last year will not be recurring, and uh, those people won't be educated about the, um, the vote. And I think that uh, we do miss a lot of the uh, People voting, we did that. I urge you to vote no. Representative King? I have a Sure. Quick thing. It's kind of a little bit of a historical fact. Um, I was the person that coordinated the movement of the faculty set seats from USG to UPI with Health Roth. And historically, getting people to run for these seats has always been a hard thing. And to think that by lowering um, or taking out a particular requirement that that's going to be uh, over term fix, no. Um, the commitment level of the person sitting in the academic seat is almost as high as far as meetings go as Gavin. Um, they have almost twice as many meetings as some of the other members that are sitting right here. Um, so I would warn against uh, taking out something like the signature requirement simply because this, these people are supposed to be representing their colleges and if we can't even expect them to get 50, 100 signatures, how are they going to be going to be represented? Um, beyond that, I do support the, the idea of having alternates built in um, simply because it is a lot of work to be an academic representative. However, I caution you against um, lowering the so-called barriers to entry simply because um, we've had trouble in the past. We've always had trouble, even before the UQA was around. When I ran my sophomore year, I was the ghost, ghost candidate because we couldn't get someone to run like two people from my college or the neural sciences. So take it by stride, learn from like things, but be very careful and make sure that you don't make it to the point that then you can't even ensure that the four people running are going to give you that seven or five percent. Representative Hines? Um, I would like to have everyone think about it. Um, you said you want to know the favor of history and saying that that doesn't diminish our standards, but like last time I checked, we really only had debates for the presidential candidates. So if you really don't have any barriers to entry for your academic college, the people don't have anything but they see like where are you standing issues, what you plan to do, how dedicated you are, then aren't people just kind of clicking on a button? Because I know I'm in the College of Liberal Arts. I don't know everyone in my college. So if there are four people running, it's going to kind of go for the name I heard once or twice or the person that I think looks the nicest, but I don't know anything about them. So, I mean, if you have no barrier, how do I know, how do I know I'm voting for the best person? At least if you had to get some type of signatures to get on the ballot, I know you had some type of dedication in wanting to run. Not that you just said, hey, but I can run. Why not? Representative Okelberg? Just to support what you just said, um, I would just like to say that I think that academic rep should be an academic position, not a popularity position. That is what for at large reps are. You know what I mean? Not that it's a popularity contest, but academic. Um,
Is there a knock? I, I agree, but I agree because I think that you know people are like contradict themselves and they say, oh yeah, we want competitive elections, so we want there to be a minimum percentage, but then they're saying, oh yeah, well we don't want to have um, what are petitions? A, a petition is there to measure a person's willingness to campaign. You say campaign, they increase it, they increase it, uh, competition. So you say we don't have to file a petition, which is practically campaigning, but you're going to campaign. If you if the person is not willing to get a petition, who's to say what's to say they're willing to campaign? I mean that doesn't make any sense. That makes sense to anybody. If you can't file a petition, you can't get other people to file a petition. What you put up flyers? I think I put up flyers harder to file a petition. So you're saying I understand like what like you're trying to do, but then you're going about it the wrong way. I, everyone's making some very valid points. I just wanted to give you my perspective from my personal experience. I wasn't really even appointed. My predecessor just came up to me at the end of the meeting and said, hey, would you be interested in doing this? I said, oh, okay. And that was it. It wasn't even announced to me. Just because he couldn't even find anyone to eat. He knew it wasn't even worth announcing that the meeting because he wasn't going to get any interest. So that, that's part of why I support it. Representative Lohner. Uh, I'll try to be more exciting this time. Uh, maybe make it make it out of the problem. Um, I, I, I think it's just uh, ridiculous that people are saying you need uh, a minimal number of signatures from anyone within the university to make yourself a valid candidate. The, the measure of a valid candidate is whether or not you can get people within your constituency to vote for you. The College of Engineering position can get 150, or you, you could require 2,000 signatures for that position, and they would all come from people that are living uh, off campus, or, and most of them will be in other colleges, and, and you're not guaranteeing that people are going to vote for them, the people that sign. Uh, and actually, to get 100 signatures is not even uh, it is more than 7% in a lot of the cases what we're talking about here. So they, you're making it harder to be able to campaign. We're not talking about during campaign. We're talking about being able to campaign. You can't campaign, at, if I recall from last year, until you have these signatures. So you're making it difficult. You can get to the campaign stage, and after that, at, at, and then you only need to get 70 signatures if you have a college of 1,000 people. So to say that getting 100 signatures, even 50 signatures, makes you a better candidate than, than, than having four people who had to get zero signatures and letting voters choose who the best candidate is, I just uh, it, I, I don't understand the principle behind that. Uh, the academic seats, some of them come from the councils, some of them come from uh, elections, which is how it should be, but. Uh, why, why is petitioning where to get on the ballot where signatures can come from any constituency make you look better than uh, a candidate, that, than a series of candidates where your constituents have to choose, you have to campaign then uh, 
to make yourself the best cancer. Uh, that's that's why I support this amendment and, and with the reduction in temper. Mr. Cavallo? Um, is there a second on any debate on the amendment? Second, second. On yeah, Representative Seltzer's amendment. Any objections? Representative Lloyd? Yeah, I think it's just Okay. Um, all in favor? Of any discussion on our Senator Slusser's amendment, please raise your hand.
It would be 3.4.06, which was, in addition to this document, that we contact all academic councils to propose an agreement that the student senator seat be given to the UPUA representative from that college. This effectively allows UPUA to run student senator elections under this code and provide student senator alternates as per university faculty senate policy and rules of faculty on the So would you like to remove all of that or just the part we talked about the alternate? Because we had originally put in the council part. Uh, we had originally put in the council part as per uh, a bunch of different people's recommendations to get us how to run those uh, per routes and or how to run those elections. So they're kind of two separate things we're going to Objections to that amendment? Okay, discussion? Yeah, sure. Okay, on 3.4.6, here's what it would read. Um, uh, contact all academic councils, propose an agreement, etc., etc., that a whole sentence is good. This effectively allows the UPUA to run Senate, student center elections under this code as per university faculty senate policy and rules as described in section 8.14. Um, and then on 8.14, um, it doesn't just strike the entire, um, that entire part. It's all underlined, just strike all that on 8.14, that is underlined. Okay, so for the discussion, Mr. Cabello. Just to clarify, was again 8.14 gone? Everything in uh, 8.4.6 after the and in the second sentence is gone. So that, that's just actually approved. Representative Colleen Smith? I still, including me. I just, yeah, I, just, I still want to um, <laughs> Now that I clarified that, I want to oppose this amendment. I do understand the frustration um, of some that, that we didn't lower the standards a little bit. Um, I personally, and I know I haven't been actively negotiating with the faculty senate, um, but I, I don't think that showing that we have higher standards, or at least according, um, is in any way going to disqualify if an alternate is available for that person to be put in. Um, I also don't think that even if they do reject the clause, we still have it in our code. There's no harm for us having it in our code. I think the worst possible thing is that they accept it, and then we don't have it in our code. Either way, um, I mean, it, 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 it's still their discretion to put in. All we're doing is trying to accommodate them. If they don't like the fact that our elections are run in certain ways and have certain standards, um, I understand the frustration on that side, but if, if they, they judge that not correct, there's really no harm in us still having that in our, in our election code. Uh, they just won't accept that, um, in, in fact, because it won't be a faculty set of policy. So I really don't see any need for removing the clause, because I really hope uh, that in the future, the faculty senate will put that provision in their rules to allow student alternates. Um, and uh, maybe once that's done, maybe next election cycle, with that provision already in there, um, you know, we can go back and look at these these two issues that are brought up almost every year uh, and that are contentious. I see no benefit for removing this section from the code. 
Um, the worst that can happen is the fact that the Senate says we're not putting a new policy in our, in our rules to uh, basically allow this provision to be realized. Representative Colleen Smith. I have a question. Go ahead.
been or college? I mean, what makes them, I guess, more qualified for that position according to the Senate? Representative Loner? Um, I, I, I can answer that. Uh, basically, it's not that that person is more qualified. They don't. And, uh, the point is not uh, that the runner up would be more qualified and the alternate would be more qualified. The point is that uh, there wouldn't be an appointment. Senate rules 
and raised committee votes on it um, and provides us feedback. There is room to amend the document moving forward um, as well on the next in the, in the coming month. But at this point, I don't see how it's so useless that we can remove it because the Senate committee hasn't even voted on it. Um, I don't even know whether they're going to vote on it. Um, but I don't see any harm in keeping these provisions in for at least a year because um, alternates are beneficial, um, will be beneficial. Um, and that, you know, I'm going to push strongly that uh, alternates are allowed for students. Um, but I think our code should at least entertain the possibility that the faculty senate does allow us to have that. I don't see any reason to remove it. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, did, um, this, 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 the sort of question for you. Is the Senate aware that um, we also put into 8.14 that uh, no delegates would become the alternate? Well, that's the one other thing. You guys push that one where that's going. I'll try to think about undo whatever kind of mess that happens. But, right. but I mean, like, were they aware of that in the bargaining process? Because wouldn't that just take care of it? That's not the other So, frankly, it would be easier to vote Okay. Because I'm delegate They're not going to take First of all, they will not accept this call that So, yes, to clarify, I neither feel that they will accept the Senate or else. Representative Slusser. Any objections to ending the debate? Okay, great. If you are in favor of this amendment, meaning striking those, meaning striking those, um, those wordings on 814 3.04.06, if you're in favor of striking those, please raise your hand at this time. Opposed? Well, abstentions? Exactly how that happens. So I would urge you not to table this to at least pass the 
to at least pass it this evening if an amendment needs to occur and the amendment needs to suppress. Representative Lohner? Uh, I, I don't think it's wise to postpone this uh, because, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't support the motion to postpone this uh, because, mostly because of how we can prepare six, seven. Uh, this will come up next week and be at least two weeks. Uh, and also because uh, it's not, uh, to clarify, I guess, what the Senate's doing. It's not really that the committee committee's rules is going to vote on this. Um, it's basically they were all going negotiations since the time meeting in November or so uh, regarding this. Um, uh, so uh, basically, uh, the negotiations are now going to be more difficult. Uh, it's not so much that there's a that it's ever waiting for the Senate for some time. President Slessing? I think possible to talk with lies that could please everyone here. So. Okay, Mr. Gravello? Um, just going on that, uh, back to the Senate to take months, if they even um, move forward with this, so tabling, postponing entire elections is probably the best idea. Um, but furthermore, I mean, if there are some inaccuracies in the clause, um, we're really subject to the, what the Senate's going to allow for their role. So they're going to craft their policy, and if we're not compliant of it, then we can't appoint, you know, and, you know, but this clause allows us to do multiple things. So just because the Senate says, well, we're not going to recognize your delegate as an alternative, and we do, well, obviously the Senate rule is the ultimate decision maker. So just because our rule says we do do that way, the Senate policy says we can't, well, then we can't. So just because we, we put an extra leniency in this rule does not, um, uh, you know, it, it's not that they have to accept this provision or else it's they're going to draft the policy that they want. Um, and this, this 8.14 allows the flexibility of a variety of solutions. Um, it, it, that happens. So I think it's fine the way it is. Uh, this could take uh, many more months um, if it even applies to this election. Um, and uh, we can always come back to them. And I think that's how you're it. So I, I move to end the on the motion to take the second. Any objections to any uh, debate on tabling? Okay, if there are none, uh, so all the, are some wait, 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 say that one more time. Uh, all those, uh, are there any objections to tabling, to, um, tabling? <laughs> to any debate? To any debate, I'm sorry. So there's no one supposed to any debate on this? Or no, the tabling it and for next time. Just and you debate on table. Don't oh, talk. I'm ending debate on, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, show of hands. All those in, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There are no objections to tabling it for the discussion on the election, so. No, we have to vote. We have to vote. We have to vote. We have to vote. Yeah, yeah, there are no objections to it. Move it to close. But there were motions to table. Okay. Okay. Show of hands, like I said, of tabling this. I mean, uh, uh, in favor of tabling it. Opposed. Sentence. <laughs> 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 Zero twenty three zero. Oh, there. Okay, I can't see your hand when it's like this. Like I'm blind, so I need you to raise it really high. Okay, so zero twenty three two. Motion fails. Further discussion. Representative Malloy. I would like to make an amendment to the at four point at four point zero eight, um, it says I I uh, I post this in ID committee, but it tells you one two people there and they're not gonna like it and they don't. An individual seeking office may only register to be a candidate for one office in two point oh two 
with the ex exception of those running for president and vice president who may simultaneously run for, a rep for one representative position, a representative position, with the completion of proper documentation, um, with the completion of proper documentation, period. Um, and then have it read in 4.06.02 at the end of that. Um, if running for president, such vice president, and a representative position, signatures gathered for one position cannot count for the other. So they would have to get 250 signatures for president, and then either 100 or 50 for their representative position. So um, the, my rationale behind this is that I do think in the past we have lost some good people who could have been a good part of this assembly. Um, they obviously showed that they want to be part of UQA by running for president. Um, and I think that if this was allowed, we would be able to keep some of those people in UQA. We want quality people, we want people who know how to run a campaign, who have reached out to students, know their concerns, and can come back here on day one, start representing them. So that's my rationale. Thank you. My second. Jack. Representative Karasik, you have an objection? Discussion. Yeah, discussion on the amendment. Go ahead. Uh, um, the reason that ID voted this down uh, is because what we're looking at is basically allowing a person to run for two different tickets. And, and one thing that should very easily happen is that they get elected to vote and therefore take votes away from one of our representatives for, let's say Gavin was running for both representative and uh, president. His name's on there twice. He's more likely to get a vote for representative because his name's on there twice which would therefore take votes away from a representative such as myself and Mr. Malloy, who's running. Uh, and therefore, disproportionately, a lot of those votes. Also, they're only going to serve as one. There are other part, there are other positions in this organization, including, uh, as, as much as we dislike it, there are positions that can't, there are representative seats that they can be appointed to afterwards, those that lose the presidential race. But I am very, very opposed to allowing someone to run for two separate positions. Uh, and normally, I use a, 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 a unified front, I guess, to divide that, but that, that's just that's where I sit. Representative Lloyd? Yes. As Representative Karasek should know, if someone does indeed win in that position, and win, if Gavin won for president and at large representative, and he accepted president over at large representative, he will not then accept his at large representative, representative position, which would mean the next highest vote getter would move up and get that position. Which in the most recent election was you. Yes, it was. Correct. In in U.S. politics, in the United States Senate, Joe Lieberman ran for vice president of the United States of America while at the same time running for the Senate from uh, to be senator from Connecticut. He lost the vice presidency, but was in the Senate and is still there today, um, being a, a independent voice um, and doing his job. Um, I I think. I mean, I, I mean, he's not a horrible senator. He represents his constituents. He says, um, and I do believe that <laughs> I do believe that we lose good people when we do not allow them to run for president and representative. This is not allowing people to run for at-large representative, off-campus representative, and academic council representative position. This is just for president, vice president, and one representative position. And they would have to go out and get those extra signatures in order to do the other office. They would not double count. President Lurch. Uh, with all due respect, this is not United States politics here. Uh, this is Pennsylvania State University politics. And as we established earlier, a lot of this is based on name recognition. The biggest problem I foresee with this, if it would have, you know, be passed, is that somebody is running for president and say on campus representative, and both, you know. Uh, elections are very contested. The person that's running for, the other people that are running for on-campus representative are not going to, the kid that's running for president has a leg up on the other his opponents. The reason being is because the person running for president has a lot of coverage in the daily police, you know, how they do interviews with all the presidential candidates. They don't do one with the on-campus or at-large reps. Also, there's the debates. You know, the representatives don't have debates, but the people running for president and vice president can participate in those debates. They get to get their name and their, you know, uh, viewpoints out to students in a more uh, publicized manner. That creates, I think, an unfair election. It would be, 
I think it would hurt our organization's cause as a whole to allow something like that to be to happen. For the discussion, Representative Mance. I just want to say that I think that I support this amendment uh, also on the grounds that I think that at this point, when we barely had any competitive elections at all, that uh, allowing someone to run for president, vice president, and a uh, representative position, it certainly uh, encourages more competition for elections. Thus, we're campaigning in our Sorry. President Lucas? Um, I speak in support of this amendment as well. Um, on the grounds that I think a lot of people that ran for president and vice president last year showed an interest in UPUA, in forming UPUA, um, in different ways than Kathy Abbott and... Valerie. Um, I didn't want to say Valerie, I was going to say vice president Russell. Um, I guess I said Abbott, whatever. <laughs> anyway, and they, they expressed, you know, reform of UPUA different from those of the people that got elected. By losing them, you know, a lot of them just went back to legal affairs, they went back to blue band, you know, wherever they came from, and we don't have their voice here as representative. Um, if they were able to run as representative and as president, you know, they lose the presidency and still, you know, win a representative position, they can be an active voice in this body. There's an inherent advantage in competition as well. Um, while I understand Representative Blair's um, apprehension, I do feel it would make these races for representatives more competitive. If someone feels they need to work in campaign to be an at-large or being on campus or off campus and they're out actively campaigning, engaging students more fiercely than they would before, if they you know, with fewer candidates, we have more competitive elections. If these candidates are getting pressed for president and vice president and also as representative or whatever, it's more attention to UPA, more attention to our elections and a healthier democracy on campus. Senator uh, This is just a question for both to uh, President Karen's uh, back. Uh, did anybody, did any of the losers come to you like after the election and ask like, how else could I get involved with UQA or uh, student government? Or to any of the representatives in here, did any of the losers uh, come to you guys and ask you, how can I get involved with the UQA? Even though I lost, how can I get involved? Because obviously they didn't, they didn't show as much urgency and as much you know desire to run if they didn't show you know after the election okay I lost but I still really have the students in mind I still really have the students in my heart I still really want to serve them but how can I go about doing that were any of those questions proposed and if so please tell me we had discussions with them afterwards yeah um, I think that um, had their enthusiasm level been Higher, they would be here. Um, but we definitely, we certainly talked to that man. Yeah, if anybody wanted to see it, I think we'd have given it to them. Um, the only one that seriously probably approached us afterwards, we had this couple conversations with uh, one of the people that ran, but um, nobody really wanted to take a position. So, just think so. Representative Lucas? Um, I don't think that necessarily negates the, the, um, their right to run as, as a representative. At the time, it looked at, it's like all in or, you know, nothing. You either get president, vice president, or you get nothing. You go on to leadership world and other organizations and effect change there. If there's the option to be, you know, a senator on this, you know, this body, if they don't win presidency, I think that is an incentive for them to stay engaged with UPUA. And it's understandable if they would go to other organizations and leadership roles if they don't win here. Mr. Jones? No, I, I mean, I do understand that there's a couple things that I do worry about. Um, one, sort of people talk about USJ, talk about infighting. Um, this could possibly lead to a lot of factions and lack of productivity. And if we really want to get an efficiency, that's a major thing that could happen. Uh, but that might be a good thing. Also, it might bring out the best in people. You can argue either way. Uh, as far as people staying involved, there's definitely an opportunity to stay involved. Uh, if you look at I mean, even last year and this year, you look at Ricardo and Mike Anderson, I mean, they both stayed in Bali, both ran for the vice president. Um, they didn't quit just because they they lost. They, they took an opportunity, they really networked, and they stayed involved. So I think that, the, that if you want to stay involved in UPA, the opportunity is there. Um, I mean, I, I certainly would give anyone the opportunity to run for president just because I feel like that's something that's such a huge responsibility to put the time into running for it. But uh, I think there's already been made in a way. 
Personally, I, I do have questions to about allowing people to run for both offices. because the clout of presidential candidates skews the election. Um, so I want to bring in a couple points. First of all, by allowing these people to run, we're all assuming that, of course, they're going to be elected. That's the sentiment that uh, uh, Representative White said, that we will retain these people. That's, again, that's one of the reasons to vote for it. Well, if we're retaining one person, all the seats that ran that were for the election had the full complement of people. They may not have been contested, but they had six on campus, et cetera. You, one person's going to get the boot. So one representative not running for president, therefore, would not be involved in the organization. So that, you could say that could be a loss um, of that individual talent. So we're automatically saying that the presidential candidates are more valuable than other uh, candidates. Um, now, why the provision failed in years past is because the clout of the presidential candidate. Uh, right now, when you vote for representative, there's a little platform statement and so, and so forth on the website. And when you vote for representatives, you have to, you know, you you have the option of going and reading about them and so forth on the website. Um, if you're voting for a presidential candidate, usually presidential candidates are defined. People will say, I'm voting for this, you know, I'm voting for this candidate. Um, and if their name appeals multiple times, you know, the six or seven other candidates, um, those people are probably going to vote for them without even looking at the other candidates because they're going to invest more time with the collegiate and advertising and so forth. And so what you have is the leftover candidates. Um, who are voting for will get a, a smaller share of the vote and they'll be less competitive. It will do the exact opposite of promoting democracy and will undermine democracy. Now, uh, to prove the point, um, in the 2002-2003 um, year in the USG Senate, um, there was something on the order of uh, 12 vacancies because of this. A lot of the presidential candidates, when they lost, they got so fed up they didn't want to work with the president, um, they decided not to even take their Senate seat. And so we had two or three candidates not even taking their Senate seat, and they got all the people that were in their campaigns to pull out, created what um, we would call now infighting. Um, so there's a lot of trouble in these provisions. I would also say that it's unfair for the president um, to be given this option. Why can't a representative run for three different positions? Um, but there's a reason for that in our Constitution. We don't even allow representatives to be part of other entities, or presidents to be part of other entities, or whatever, without special permission because we want to get as many different people running for the office as possible. And if you commit to one office and run, if you don't get elected, there are other ways to get involved in UQA if you really want to. And I think this way is probably the worst way to try and recycle people back in UQA, and I strongly urge um, uh, no vote for this amendment. Further discussion, Representative Lucas? No. Uh, Chair Corbell, with all due respect, um, this isn't USG, and I think, you know, this body, we should have more confidence in those running for president and vice president. Um, by citing an example from USG infighting, I think it's irrelevant here because it's UQA, it's a different entity. Um, it's a younger organization and there is less infighting at this point. I think it's important that we encourage people to run for president and vice president without risking um, not being involved. Mr. Cabela. Well, I had a question for Steve. Um, do you think that the political landscape of the university has changed in four years? I mean, I was talking more of the mentality of the, of the students running for office, not necessarily the nature of the organization. We have some different safeguards in place to prevent that sort of stuff, but the nature of people running is, is what I was afraid of and how they would teach it. Well, essentially, like, what my argument is here is not that, it's not an assumption that, you know, they're well intentioned that I think they've been disenfranchised in the past. Presidential and vice presidential candidates have been disenfranchised in the past by not being given the option to run as a representative. By trying out this option, we can see whether or not this holds up. But, you know, if someone doesn't want to risk not getting a, yeah, a representative position if it is essentially easier than running for president and vice president. I think without giving them the option, though, you know, that's, that's just a, that's not encouraging them to stay with you way. Um, with that said, if they have to get twice as many signatures as everyone else, they have to do that much more constituency work, that shows a huge dedication to UQA. And if they really aren't interested in a representative position, I don't think they go out and get 100 additional signatures, because they have to be different people than those they got from presidential and vice presidential. Um, yeah. I would argue, too, to um, Representative Cabello's question on whether the political 
landscape has changed that, in fact, most of the classes who were around when USG existed have now or soon will graduate out. My year, the junior year, will be the last year that USG ever existed, and that was only four of us a semester. So I would argue the political landscape has changed drastically considering that. I was just kind of confused about the whole getting uh, the petition signed for to get on and get out of time. Your mom, so you have to get 100 and then 250. But technically, if I'm running for president and get 250, can I just get 100 people to sign it twice? Say, so here's my presidential one and here's my representative one. Like, who's going to set that? No, that's, called, that's the job of the election commission. If it's in the election code, they have to check for it. Um, they go through the process to make sure that um, the people actually on are not replicated, are not replicated and are actually Penn State students. Obviously, they can't check every single one, but they have safeguards in place to make sure that if there is a question that goes up, they go through one by one. Um, but they they will make sure that they are not the same. Oh, okay. In this case, I think that I filed with the health and that I see the wisdom. And there being a risk to the aspiring um, candidates uh, deciding to run for president, I think that it puts more on the bond of the candidate when they're assessing what do I want to be? Do I want to be the president or do I want to be a representative? If in running for the president you cannot run for representative, I think that I don't know, just the wisdom and there being a choice that has to be made. I just feel like when you do that, it uh, undermines the cloud of being a representative. It's like saying, all right, I want to be a, I want to be the president, but I'll settle for being a representative if I lost, because you're pretty much guaranteed that spot. So if I run out and I just say, okay, I'm kind of popular, I can get 350 people to sign, and I'll vote for president, but I know that if I don't get it, I can still get whatever position I wanted elsewhere. It, I don't feel like it makes other people it undermines the color of what you had to do to be a representative. You had people who decided, okay, I want to do this, and they didn't get it, so they're here to do. That doesn't mean they wanted to do that. That was their fallback option, and that's what they have in the land of Senator Uh I agree with the service to the constituencies in one area or another. If you're running for uh, an at-large, well, uh, the president, for example, you're trying to cater all constituencies. Uh, that includes your own, but uh, you know, when you're running for a universal office, it is different um, than running for a specific constituency. And there is a possibility that if you're trying to cater to all constituencies, you might not be able to cater as much as, as a representative would need to the specific constituency in which they're elected. Uh, so it's really a tug of war on responsibility. I also think it could potentially clutter the presidential ballot by having a lot of different people um, that, yeah, are serious about running for president, but, uh, you know, want to be involved in UPUA in general, um, but aren't going to get it all because they're trying to retain their representative seat at the same time. Uh, I think it could lead to an explosion of the number of people kind of timidly running for president, not really seriously running for president, and I think that also does a disservice to the representative position. Um, and with that, I think we can explore a lot of different options here, so I'm going to end with any objections to any debate? I have, I have checked on the basis that um, I just wanted to respond to those comments. Um, in terms of constituency, perhaps um, we should require that vice presidential or presidential candidates who want to run for a representative seat should have to run for an at-large representative seat. 
that way their constituency is the university and is not limited to on-campus or off-campus representatives. And they are speaking for both positions effectively. Um, but people running timidly for president or vice president, I don't think, characterizes these people's intentions um, very well. Inherently, you know, an incumbent or another person has an advantage over another person who runs. Um, let's say we had a president running for re-election. That person would inherently have more um, clout, more name recognition. Same thing goes for someone running for president, vice president, you know, and running for representative. They're going to have more name recognition, but they're also exerting much more effort and going through all the necessary steps to run for both positions. So if Chair Capello, you would prefer that the app, they are required to run as an app large in addition to, um, we can make that be a friendly amendment. I'm Senator Malloy. Um, I'm a little bit confused on the change to 4.6.2. Can, yeah. you, can you fix that? Sorry, um, it's not Basically, it says uh, after the. Whichever, you can put it after, after any example, ABC 15123. Uh -huh. um, if running for president and vice president and a representative position. Signatures gathered for one position cannot be counted for the other. Okay. So we want to rephrase that to make it more clear that they can't double count by a sure that's accomplished. What about 4.08? Could you reread that? Yes. Um, after and uh, cannot may only register be candidate for one office in 2.0 point whatever two, uh, with the exception of those running for president and vice president who may simultaneously run for a representative position with the completion of proper documentation. Okay. Any other objections to any debate? Um, yeah, I think we only, I think it was only mentioned of the advantages of running for two positions. But remember, um, they'll be running against candidates at both those positions. And those running against my president can say, well, you're running for two offices. And those running for representative can say, can't you pick and choose? So there's disadvantages into black <laughs> <laughs> for what? No, it's <laughs> what? Um, so, we've only explored the advantages, but there are also disadvantages to doing it. So, people might have to make that hard choice. Also, the collegiate focuses on the presidential race. They'll focus on why you rank for two positions. So, that's a negative of this. And I think we should just let the opportunity to occur um, by putting this in the, in the election program. Any other objections? Okay, thank you. Um, Senator
Okay, Amendment fails for the discussion on the elections code. Mr. Kearns. Uh, if you look at 601, 60601, uh, that's something that's been added in here and I'll bring it to your attention, uh, just so you're aware. Uh, it reads, prior to the start of the campaign period, the commission shall set the fair market value price for all common campaign items, i.e. shirts, posters, paper, copies, based upon written quotes of price, which shall be uniform for all candidates, all financial statements, to avoid confusion on real market price discrepancies. This information must be published to all candidates prior to the start of the campaign period. Uh, the reason for this is uh, there's been a couple of notable times when this has been, a, a, been an issue as far as what exactly is fair market value. Uh, for some things, it's going to be very tough to define early on. But things like t-shirts, if, if you describe basically one side, two side t-shirts, single color, double color, uh, it can really help out because that's usually one of the uh, main problems, at least that I found. So. Um, that was the rationale behind it. President Pines. So what happens if you're running for office and you happen to know people who give you a discount? Is it really fair that you should pay more than the other people? Uh, it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, you can't get a discount or anything. It's basically, if you know somebody gave you a discount, no one else can get it. You're technically not allowed to get that person anyway. So it's the whole rules behind the election. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Cabello? That's not necessarily true. It's true to extent. You have to report it at the real market value, but you can get a discount. So you can buy 100 shirts for a dollar, but you have to declare the real real price that everyone else can get to. So you can technically save the money, but it goes against your total. That makes sense. Yeah. Further discussion on the elections code.
eventually finally vote on this. Uh, I think you have to think about whether or not to complete. Uh, obviously, if we go back to high D, I don't think it really hurt the uh, really hurt the organization. Depending on the score amendments or coming to shore, probably. Um, but uh, before you vote on it, I would say think about the completeness and whether or not you're satisfied and whether or not you think it's satisfactory. Further discussion on the elections code as a whole.
Hubert Hines. Yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? No. Okay. Yeah, okay. Andrew Perisette. Yes. John King. Yes. John Leonard. Daniel Lars. Yes. Sam Lohner. No. Benjamin Lombard. Yes. Stephen Lucas. No. Nick Nance. Yes. Uh, Sean Malloy. Um. Upstate. Samantha Miller. No. Christopher Morrell. Christopher Knott. Yes. Ellie Oakleberg. May I pass? I'm sure. Yes, I know. Greg Plum. Greg Plum. Brian Poland. Yes. Kelly Potter. Megan Quinn. Of Saint. Christian Ireland. Amy Sanders. Yes. Philip Slusser. Richard Chermansky. Colleen Smith. Yes. Matthew Smith. No. Michael Smith. Michael Wallace. No. Kara <laughs> Zinger. Of Saint. Oh. And uh, Colbert. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, no. So we're going to need, we have, by my count, which is usually worked wrong, um, we're going to need, we have a total of 21 votes, we're going to need 14 for two thirds. You Um, Kayla and I met yesterday 
to um, discuss how our Constitution goes about and the provisions of requiring members to attend what we call constituency organization meetings. And um, we've had some issues with that in the past um, in trying to further relations with these two organizations uh, because we have not had we have not had membership adequately represented in our meetings. Um, nor have we really had off-campus representatives attending borough council or OCSU meetings. And unfortunately, if you read the Constitution, at large representatives are supposed to attend UPAC meetings, which are closed and cannot be attended by the public. Student Programming Association meetings, FAD meetings, which no longer exist, and Student Organizational Conduct Committee, which is technically part of UPUA now and therefore does not have meetings that you could attend. So therefore, this really does need a very quick revision. And what uh, the revision is as follows. Um, it, it begins as the same, it, it's to attend the regular constituency organization, organization meetings. You can read it there. Um, it adds Greek council representatives attending their respective council meetings, at large representatives attending or regularly scheduled meetings of at least one non-student government organization. So that would mean that an at-large representative need attend for instance, thespians or something like that, just another club's organization to tap into that constituency. And attendance at each of these respective meetings shall be subject to the attendance policies for UPUA as set in our bylaws, and the chair of the assembly shall have the authority to change the number of meetings that a representative is required to attend, so long as that change effectively renders representation of at least one representative at each respective organization's meeting. Any change imposed by the chair must be submitted as an official memorandum to the assembly. Um, the reason, as I said, we're putting this in is because we have not had, this was a requirement that is in our Constitution, although some organizations are outdated, we have not had representatives fulfilling this requirement. Had this mandates that they would fulfill it or be subject to our attendance policy, in addition to um, allowing, giving the chair the authority vested here to allow the rotation to meetings, as we talked about before. Um, on talking to, uh, with Kayla, it was suggested that we change that to one, from one to two, to add appropriate, um, to add appropriate uh, representation at those meetings, and I will be making that amendment once we bring this to the floor by two thirds, assuming we do. Senate questions? Second. Any questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, so the does that mean that you have to like schedule when you want to go, like to the meeting, or if you just have to? attend at least like one or two during this lesson. Because otherwise how do you guarantee two people to be there? As this is passed, um, pending Ralph's uh, directive as an official memorandum of the assembly, all members would have to attend all regularly scheduled meetings. But Ralph can decide to institute a rotation process should he decide or whoever the chairman is next year. Um, and therefore with that rotation process, what this is effectively doing is creating a caucus of the, of the on-campus representatives, and we're, I'm going to be speaking them, what we really should be doing is meeting outside of these meetings so that so that the information is understood, so that when those two, one or two members do go to the meeting, if we don't have all six go, they are presenting a unified front and know exactly what's going on at large meetings, borough council meetings, OCSU meetings, and then such. So we're trying to solidify our connections to the usual organizations. That's really what this, what the purpose of this is. Um, like, I understand us having to go there, but will their representative be attending our meeting? Their representatives are here tonight. Um, well, uh, Andrew Coons resigned from his position. Um, and so we have three representatives here this evening. Kayla, we actually had uh, five, uh, two of them had to leave. But the fact is they're not at the table. That's yeah, yeah. Well, they were invited to say that. Right, I know, but right. just formality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they are here. Is that a question for Yeah. So basically, are we going to we're sign up for the meeting, right? Or, no, because it was last semester, it wasn't really a problem. What happened was we signed a, a paper that said we were attending these meetings. I did my three, we did our three, but what happened was it got confusing because some people left. Remember, we had the heroes were resigning. So, you know, out of respect, I kind of showed up when like when I could, but I kind of felt like, well, I did my meeting and I'll show what I can, but then it kind of felt like everybody was, well, it's coming down to all of us, like all six of us going to be there. But I, Simply knew I signed up for this specific date. Now, I mean, there's no problem now, I just need to know like, in advance what I have to do so that it's not like an inconfusion. So, are we signing up for like, the date after the meeting, or is it just we 
you all go. You know, this provision would clarify exactly what responsibilities you guys would have instead of just, I developed that rotation system. This is, like, I guess, codifying it um, or, or further developing the system in which we, we have our representatives attend the Arch meeting. Because of collaboration, we, it was really just us three, and we would show up together. And then after a while, it was like, okay, well, I have to do something tonight, but I'm not really on the list anyway, so you know, it shouldn't be my fault if I don't show up. It's six other people. So I think that was confusion. So I just basically said, so just got to get together and talk about it. There is a typo um, on this document, that typo being uh, Representatives Malloy and Representatives Morrell are not sponsoring this document. This document is not coming from the committee. It is uh, a a document sponsored jointly by me and Representative Um And so it still requires the two-thirds to be brought here, but it is not from the committee itself. Motion to bring this to form. Second. 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 Any objections to bringing this to the floor? I object. Mr. Bell? I, I don't object on principle. I think this is a great job. A document, uh, but I think that uh, this is an amendment to the Constitution, and I think it should require a little time to see committee for people to read um, and uh, comment on. And, and I don't even have a piece; I don't even have it in front of me right now. Uh, so um, this this is a good thing, and, and we're I mean, as of now, we are going to do the rotation thing. I'm going to talk with the Arch person after the meeting um, if she's still here uh, by that time. Uh, but I since this is an amendment to the Constitution, I, I do think that we should. Um, not bring this to the floor now, which means it will automatically go to the committee. So by voting no to bring it to the floor, it goes automatically to the committee. Um, I would prefer not debating constitutional amendment tonight, but uh, that's up to you guys. President Malloy, do you have an objection? Yes, I, 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 uh, I'm not really opposed to this amendment. Uh, We are going to deal with this in the near future. We are going to have representatives and vice versa. They will have them here. Um, so the need to address this at this immediate time is unnecessary. And I think we should go through the proper procedures before we go to the floor. Okay. Any other objections? Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you are in favor of bringing this to the floor. Please raise your hand high. One, two, three, four. All those opposed?
Um, okay, so as we moved it before, we have a special presentation. This is me and Andrew talking about what we did over the weekend. <laughs> I think Faculty Senate is next week, um, so it would be in two weeks' time. It's like a, it just as a warning, um, it's a 25 slide presentation. Um, we cannot cut the presentation down, we worked so hard on it, and we spent days together, so it's not going to be cut down. Okay? There's no lesson? No, they will not have the weekend. I have a general assembly meeting. Okay, thank you. I'm just wondering if the technical equipment costs money for receiving. No, it doesn't. It's not We may have to. Oh, we will do it in two weeks' time. Okay. I mean, it's, it's 1040 right now. I know it's getting late. We have a lot of reports to go through. But at the same token, um, we're going to have other legislation coming up, uh, election issues coming up, confirmations coming up. Postponing this is not going to get rid of it. And <laughs> 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 we'll make a video and send it to you. Postponing this will allow it to come up earlier in the um, evening, which will lend much more friendly ears to both balance and um, Okay, well, forget that, but I think I try. I would blame, I, I say we should postpone this. Um, it is getting late, but this should be something else. Okay, and, and yeah, we can make it. Um, with that said, any objections to postponing this? Point of order, I didn't get a second. I oh, I'm sorry. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Any objections to postponing this? Any objections to postponing this two weeks from today? Uh, I, I just have a question about the uh, schedule already. Um, two weeks from now? Is it no, the director of transportation, I believe. Teresa Davis.
reports in front of you that summarizes quite a few things. I meant uh, just a couple brief points. Um, as you can see, our numbers have depleted quite substantially since last semester. We lost a lot of people studying abroad, a couple more um, who fell ill, and a couple um, who were scheduling and so forth. Um, that made it impossible for them to come. Uh, where the steering committee is interviewing six or seven people come Sunday uh, for vacant positions. Um, I know Arsh is in the process of trying to fill a non-campus position for us as well, and the academic seats are always an ongoing thing. So we're looking to see probably some fresh spaces for the remaining seven weeks um, when we come back. There will be four or five assembly meetings um, come pretty soon. We still are accepting applications for positions, so if you know people who want to apply, um, you can have them still send me the application. It's on the website. Um, I did have a meeting yesterday with some of the judicial affairs regarding the um, Board of Arbitration and how students are selected for the University Hearing Boards. Uh, they were a very um, temperate in their response. The idea is to govern people in the process in the way we outline, uh, but they're definitely interested in moving forward. I've scheduled a series of meetings, so if anything, if any breakthrough happens there, I'll let you know. I'm also meeting tomorrow with Mary, uh, Barry, and Jen from um, Uni Student Activities regarding uh, uh, the uh, Board of Arbitration, the merger of SOCC. Um, and finally, the note, um, Josh and Kate contact me, tell, tell me that they couldn't be here tonight uh, for various work related reasons. Um, and they wanted to sit down with me um, to kind of gauge what they're supposed to be doing and moving forward. Um, so, other than that, they're important. I think explains most of it. The steering committee is charged with interviewing all vacancies. Yeah, all vacancies. Um, not filled by academic seats or off. So on or off campus at large seats are in our jurisdiction and freshmen are our jurisdiction. And we do have a significant number of open right now. So um, Chair Cabello, I'll, I'll ask you to do this now or whenever you see fit, but I think for, for everyone in the assembly, I'd like we'd like clarification on exactly what it means with the elections code now. If we're using 2008 to be amended, can we bring forth the new elections code? Can you go over all that so that we know how to proceed? Um, so 2009, the amendments made to this document were voted down, so they cannot be brought back to the floor in any capacity unless there's a motion to reconsider the vote that was already taken, which requires a two-thirds vote. Um, the election codes are perpetual in the sense that um, they, they're used for reading language of the first article, they're used for whatever elections we have forever unless we change the code. The only thing that changes is obviously the dates, the last has on that. So right now we're using the 2008 code with obviously the new date for the elections but everything else is the same. Um, and the only way to bring back all of this in, in, in its entirety or with any few modifications would be to reconsider this um, which can only be done by someone who voted um, in the negation of the document. I'm pretty sure that's the rule. So you have to vote, you would have to vote no in order to bring this back. Yes, we can. The amendments to 2008, as long as they're not the ones that have been made in this document, if that makes sense. Did I answer your question, Andrew? Yes, you did. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Cabello? Yeah. Mr. Cabello, I'm just going to ask you about the Board of Arbitration and Arbitrators. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, basically, what's happened before, before you tonight is the 2009 elections code that was discharged by a decommit. By the time you read this, we will have voted. And you voted to send that back to the committee. Actually, no, you voted to put the 2008 one in place. I'm just going to tell you that there were some very necessary things in this document. Um, one of those being that the School of Nursing and the Schreier Honors College are not currently, are not currently part of our elections. Um, and so, since they cannot, since the only way to actually make them part of our election would be to have a motion to reconsider at the following, at the meeting, not next week, but the following week. And that would, of course, Mr. Rob said, have to come from the gate. Otherwise, uh, Shriers and School of Nursing will not have seats that are elected by this body. Uh, well, that are, not, that are elected to this body, excuse me. Uh, there's a bunch of other things that I would encourage you to read on here. Um, including upping the money that they would receive to $1,200 because that's what we have from UPAC. So right now we have 
because right now they need to be paid under what we normally pay them at $200. There's a lot of other things in here if you want to send me an email, I can tell you what those are, but we really do need to reconsider this document. We can remove something if it's contentious, but a lot of things need to be in there. Um, we, we also worked on a policy to clarify the responsibilities of representatives, which was also recommitted to our committee, so that will come before you again. We had the um, elections commissioners that are coming before us shortly, and will come to you in two weeks. We also have a treasurer and two brief seats, two, two brief seat liaisons that will come in, be coming before you in two weeks. And we're doing this all with four members because Representative Corey resigned, and now Representative um, Leonard resigned as well. So Corey I did need, illness. What? Corey did Corey illness. Corey illness, of course. Yes, he, he took us back, so I was like, as a reporter on my team. Uh, Representative Leonard due to other commitments. So we are have four members um, in the committee, three of which are here right now, and um, we are working to try to get everything done. Bear with us. We have a lot to do. Thank you. Questions? Is there a knock? Do you need all of them? Like, <laughs> 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 yeah, do you want people to like, do you? You can be in the Well, we, we need, we could use two more members to the committee. Uh, but you cannot be a member of more than two committees, is it? So, um, if you're already a member of two committees, then you cannot be a member of ID. If anyone's interested in ID who is not a member of two committees, please come and see me. I'll buy you pizza if you decide to join in. Representative Lamar? Well, this is a question regarding the ID committee. I wasn't informed that uh, Mr. Leonard has resigned. Yeah, yeah. Is there any way that you can get this on? That would be the program. <coughs> that would be in Representative King's report. Okay. We'll wait. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, are there any other questions for Representative Karasik really, uh, pertaining to ID committees? No? Okay. Moving on to programming, Representative King. Uh, there are no new major developments. Do you guys? Uh, I've got the major report. Yeah, just to talk about the thumb responsibilities. Uh, we just found out yesterday, uh, in the day, about Sean. So, uh, as of now, there hasn't been a turnaround. Uh, I plan to meet with Sean in a very near future, the next week or so, to, to focus on that and tie up his uh, meeting with Representative Slusser. Uh, Any other questions for Representative King? Thank you. Facilities, Representative Mance. Um, unfortunately, I uh, don't really pay any attention to the original report that I gave you guys to notice these changes or just what I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> and in spite of some uh, non great attendance in our last uh, committee meetings, we actually had a
problem associated. Has the advisory board taken on any structural change initiatives or any, are, are you guys exploring that at all? Well, today's meeting actually was not um, just the hard work of the board. I'm, I'm not going to lie, I, I didn't really get much out of uh, the meeting today. Uh, I think that the most structural problem is the fact that me being the only one that's on the hard work of the hard work. I'm the only one. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Chris. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not, or another representative other than myself, Chris, is not able to serve on the subcommittees. Today, what they were talking about are a bunch of issues that have come up with lots of late night programs and programs in general um, safety issues, security issues, what they need to do to prevent things in the future. I mean, it, it's, it's great. No, I, I think it, it's a good cause, but I really wasn't able to work. We are going through some structural changes right, right now. Um, at our, in our last two previous meetings, we were making arrangements to have more representation from cultural organizations that are near the uh, Paul Rosen Cultural Center. And right now, we have um, a pending issue where we're trying to resolve whether we want to keep the International Student Association. They have a permanent seat on the board, and we're um, debating whether or not we should keep that seat. Besides that, there are no other structural changes that are going on. People who are on the Hub Rooms Advisory Board can get on the subcommittees, and we did divide it into subcommittees, and we divided all the people who are on the board into around two out of three subcommittees. Any other questions for Representative Mance? Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, academic affairs. Representative Smith?
this test A name class, though, uh, is because the science college is one of those that only pays if they have many other possible. They don't want to have them to have last night's 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 night's
But um, Purdue and Indiana University are teaming up and sort of doing like a, con a consortium, like a statewide kind of team up, and they're working together um, in the state of Indiana. Um, and it just, they're very passionate about that issue, really. I mean, there's lots of other details, but um, I did not mean for the article to be presented the way that it was, and that was certainly not what I really talked to him about. So, we can talk later, yeah. and I'll give a whole presentation on the other stuff. So, I'm sorry if that, like, was kind of too much in your realm. That's no. not what I talked to him about. All right. Any other questions for Representative Miller? Okay, moving on, diversity in campus life. Representative Lucas. All right, this week um, we work, we um, approved the three different initiatives that we worked on last semester, the legislative quarterly or semesterly as we might change it. Um, the student district has state and an annual um, diversity multicultural uh, networking event. Um, so we have some legislation from our committee coming up in a couple of weeks. Those will be submitted this week at steering, along with the draft of the first edition of the quarterly. Um, I also consulted with the committee about the proposed budget. Um, we have to prepare a budget by Friday, as you guys learned from President Kieran, and we mapped out um, different initiatives we could take with expanded funding. Any questions?
that they failed. There were many reasons why I voted against it. I personally voted against it because I saw there were many, many things people needed to change. The elections code of last year was fine. New provisions were necessary, but we can deal with last year's. That's the whole point of this legislative body. Senator Malloy? Yeah, um, more like hearted note. Um, it's Sam's birthday next week too. She turns the big two one. Um, additionally, this week we saw the inauguration of our new president, of President Obama. And I would ask, yeah, a little bit. Um, I don't know if you heard, but um, regardless of whether or not you vote for him, I hope you are inspired by his speech that we all need to work together to help make our country better because we are not in a good place right now. So I would hope you would join me and your countrymen to help do that, regardless of your political affiliation or who you vote for. So thank you. Representative Karasek? Um, in response to Steve, um, the ID committee had on this report for many weeks, please contact me or please contact me by email if you have concerns, opinions, or something you want to see in this document. I was contacted by two people, Chairman Smith, Chair Gravel. We're gonna I'm gonna open that up again. Please contact me if you have concerns over this document. It's my fault and my fault alone that this document came to you last night late. Um, we should have done that. Obviously with ADPS, other holidays and with the fluctuation of our members, that's why that. but that's no excuse. It should have come to you earlier. But at the same time, there was opportunity, and I'm giving you that opportunity once again. If you have concerns about this document, you now have it in front of you. You have two weeks. Please email me, and I will discuss it. And hopefully somebody who voted no will, be, will make a motion to reconsider in two weeks. Other comments? Okay, and with that, roll call. Secretary. Mike Almeyer. Mike Anderson. Jim Burns. Ruth K. Graza. Mark Cannon, John Cravello, Adam Brown, Pat Gordon, Nicholas Heim, Hubert Heim, Andrew Harrison, Gavin Sheeran, John King, Arsh, I figured. Matthew Lockman, Daniel Large, Sam Lobar, Benjamin Lombard, Stephen Lucas, Nick Mant, Sean Malloy, Samantha Miller, Christopher Morrell, David Munn, Christopher Knott, Ellie Ogleberg, Joey Olson, Greg Plum, Brian Poland, Kelly Potter, Megan Quinn, Christian Ragland, Valerie Russell, Amy Sanders, Philip Slusser, Richard Tremansky, Colleen Smith, Matthew Smith, Michael Smith, Ricardo Torres, Ian Vickery, Michael Wallen, Cindy Wong, Kara Zinger, Nicole Zinni. Meeting is adjourned.